So the question is, how do we resolve this predicament that businesses and communities face of being caught in the debt trap? Well, we need to reduce our dependence upon banks and conventional money. And we do that by creating independent exchange media that are interest-free. And let me diverge for a moment to tell a little story. I grew up in the city of Rochester in New York State, which is in the northeastern part of the United States. And the one thing, I guess, that Rochester was most famous for was the Eastman Kodak Company, the company that dominated the market for photography for over 100 years, founded in 1888 by George Eastman. And uh, the Kodak Company still exists, but between 1988 and 2008, the employment at Eastman Kodak dropped by 80%. And in 2012, the company declared bankruptcy. What happened? Digital photography is what happened. Now, digital photography is a prime example of something that is called a disruptive technology. And one of the books that I am indebted to uh, for introducing this concept is The Innovator's Dilemma, written by an MIT professor, Clayton Christensen. So the book was written before digital photography disrupted the photography market, but uh, he used other examples. The ironic thing about it is that digital photography was invented at Eastman Kodak Company. But when the engineer who invented it showed it to management, their response was, that's cute, but don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> well, why? Well, because their cash cow was film and chemicals and processing, and they didn't want to disturb that market. So they resisted developing digital photography. But others took it on and did develop it. Now, initially, uh, a disruptive technology is inferior. And this first digital camera was the size of a toaster. Certainly not very practical, and the resolution was very poor. But as the technology was developed and improved, it was eventually able to displace almost totally the old technology. So I argue that we have disruptive technologies in the realm of money and banking. And what those are, are private currencies issued by trusted producers and direct credit clearing amongst buyers and sellers. The concept of credit clearing is, is well established. Uh, banks have been doing it for a long, long time. You know, uh, I might pay you by writing a check drawn on my bank in Arizona and you might deposit that check in your bank in some other place like Kuala Lumpur, and uh, it's no problem. The reason it's no problem is because the banks have a way of clearing their obligations amongst themselves. So we can do the same thing with traders directly. Uh, traders that have something to sell and want to buy something can simply clear credits amongst themselves. And uh, this is actually being done. But some examples of private currencies, during the 1930s and the Depression, we had many different script issues, which were basically private currencies issued by different entities, uh, businesses, and school districts. And I wrote about that in my second and third books. In Argentina, we had uh, popular trading clubs popping up from the 1990s onward, and each of those clubs issued their own currency notes as a way of transacting business. Uh, even provinces in Argentina were issuing provincial notes uh, because there wasn't enough national currency reaching the hinterlands. 
Uh, we have rebate currencies like Canadian tire money. Uh, airline frequent flyer miles could be a private currency if they would make them transferable easily from person to person. And all kinds of company credit vouchers. Now the way a private currency works is this. You have a, an issuer and the issuer could be a business or it could be a municipal government or some other entity. Basically, they could put their currency into circulation by using it to pay their workers and suppliers. When those workers and suppliers provide services and goods. Now, the workers and suppliers, of course, need to pass that on. They need to do something with it. So you need to get the merchants in the local community to accept that currency in return for the goods and services that they bring to market. But the thing that makes the whole thing work is the reciprocity circuit being closed when the issuer accepts the currency back in payment for something of value. Now, if it's a business issuer, that business issuer has to provide goods and services to the market and accept his own currency in return for payment. In the case of a municipal issuer, they have to accept it as payment for taxes and fees. So that's basically the reciprocity circuit that you have to close in any private currency issuance. So I'm sure you all have some familiarity with the concept of liquidity. Very simply, liquidity is the ability to pay. Now, whether it's ability to pay in conventional money or in some alternative kind of payment. But uh, just to give an example of liquidity versus illiquidity, people often fail to make a distinction between money and wealth. We tend to use those terms interchangeably in many contexts. But wealth may not be liquid. You may own real estate. You may own uh, inventories in your business. You may own goats, sheep, cows, might have crops in the field. Those are illiquid forms of wealth. You cannot use them normally to make payments to people that you owe something to. So you have to first take them to market and convert them into money. Monetization is the process of creating money, transforming in illiquid wealth to liquid wealth. So th this is done currently when banks make a loan on collateral. So you might go to a bank as a business and you say, um, I've got inventories and accounts receivable. These are close to liquid, but they're not quite. Um, would you lend me money on the strength of those assets as collateral? Or even more extreme, would you lend me money on the basis of the factory buildings and the equipment that I own? So in the process of granting a loan on that collateral, the bank is monetizing the value of that collateral. Now we can do that directly. With direct monetization by producers, uh, the business spends its own currency into circulation and then later accepts it back in payment, just as we saw in the diagram that I showed a minute ago. So in either case, we're taking the value of existing supplies uh, and putting it in a form that can be used as payment. Now, <clears throat> we have in existence local credit clearing exchanges that provide this service to businesses. <clears throat> These are just a few. Uh, BBX, whose logo I show on the slide, is actually one that you have right here in Malaysia. It's run by a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, she claims that they have 30,000 business members in 11 different countries as part of this credit clearing trade exchange. The IRTA is the International Reciprocal Trade Association. It's the trade association for commercial barter companies or trade exchanges. Now what they do, of course, is not barter, it's credit clearing. 
the way it works is this. You have a, an association, which is a network of trust, and you have members who join that association. Now, I distinguish between issuing members and non-issuing members. The issuing members are the ones that have the capacity to provide things that everybody wants. So they qualify to have a line of credit. That means that they can spend before they earn. They can have a balance in their account that is negative. Everybody else must have a positive balance before they can spend. So the way it starts out is one of the issuing members uses his credit to buy something from another member. Those credits can then circulate throughout the community of traders. Eventually, he has to clear his balance by accepting credits to pay for what he provides to the market. It's a very simple concept, but it's very effective. So the benefits of community currencies and trade exchange credits, they provide an independent means of payment that does not involve the banks that can be interest-free and that we can have under our own control at our local community level. So that reduces our dependence on bank borrowing, reduces our interest costs, reduces the risk of insolvency because now we don't have to speculate about our ability to acquire dollars or ringgit or other official currency. We can transact business in our own currency. And it provides the local economy with supplemental liquidity. Now, just as in a community, everybody is able to use ringgit whether they borrow from a bank or not, Likewise, everybody in the community could use the private currencies that we issue to transact their own business. So we can enable our local businesses to better compete with, in, with uh, transnational companies and corporate chains, and we can enable a more complete use of the available labor and supplies. Uh, there, yeah, there are, in many instances, situations where we have surplus capacity alongside unmet needs. Now, why can't we match up the surplus capacity with the unmet needs? Well, typically it's because there isn't enough money in circulation within the community. The money is somewhere else. So we can ameliorate that situation. So I've been trying to work with uh, entrepreneurs and uh, social change agents and others to try to bring into reality uh, more of these innovative approaches to exchange. And the skills and the expertise needed to do this uh, revolve around mainly these four things. You have to think in terms of uh, sound principles of reciprocal exchange. And sound principles of commercial banking have long since been cast aside. And what banks do today, uh, to a large extent, is unsound. And mon much of what they monetize is improper. When a bank monetizes government debt, that is an improper basis for creating money. Because money should be created on the basis of goods and services that are in the market now or shortly to arrive in the market. We have to think in terms of systems. And uh, this is one advantage I have from my engineering background, is systems thinking, particularly chemical engineering, because it's all about systems, moving things from one place to another, heating them up, cooling them down, mixing them together. Uh, we also should be looking at the conditions that lead to innovative uh, change. and. Uh, the Innovation Secrets of Steve Jobs is one of the books that I recommend. I've been fascinated by the life of Steve Jobs and the work that he has done uh, with computers and other innovations that he brought to market. And we need to also understand the science of networks. <clears throat> so what I see coming on the horizon, and not very far off, is mutual credit clearing exchanges I expect to proliferate around the world that these will develop standard practices of design and practice, which will allow the exchanges to network together. 
just like our computers are networked kit together today. And I expect that we will see a worldwide web of exchange that's free of interest and free of uh, bank control. So we can maintain control of credit at the local level while having a means of payment that's globally useful. That's the ultimate objective. So we have the power to do that. It's just a matter of getting the pieces assembled and having the, uh, the passion to bring it about. Thank you.